Chapter six is where we get into, as we alluded to in chapter five, the reactions of alkenes. That's where we will spend our time for the first two thirds, three quarters of the chapter. And then we'll spend the last part talking about the stereochemistry of addition reactions, which is where a lot of the ideas from chapter four come into play. You'll notice in addition to the cover art from the textbook, I've added the image below right, for the deep end, because just like with chapter four in general chemistry, when we learned about balancing redox reactions by the half reaction method, this is where we go into the deep end of organic, right? We're diving into reactions and reaction mechanisms. But the key thing, the key strategy moving forward will be keeping the fundamentals that we laid in chapter five in place. Yep. We learned that alkenes exist as one of the members of those reaction families. In this case, family one, as the textbook lays them out. We have a pi bond in the alkene that's weak relative to the other sigma bonds, and it's easily broken, which allows our alkenes to undergo addition reactions. And that most of the reactions we'll be looking at in chapter six are addition reactions where we're adding things to the molecule. The alkene is acting as the nucleophile in the first step because of the pi bond. And thus the first species that it reacts with is an electrophile. So you'll notice for each of these reactions, the first step is taking an alkene and exposing it to an electrophile. And then we'll take it from there. The general theme right now is that alkenes undergo electrophilic addition reactions, term that was introduced in chapter five. Right? Electrophilic addition reaction. It reacts with an electrophile in the first step and things get added to the molecule, hence an electrophilic addition, which I think is all summarized on the next slide, slide two here. Okay. With a little bit more information. I'm thinking about reaction coordinate diagrams, the first step in the reaction where we are adding the electrophile, uh, that is a slow step. Okay? That is a rate determining step in this case. Okay? And if we think about the reaction that we got in chapter five, taking an alkene and adding HBr, okay, the first step was the relatively slow addition of a proton and that proton H plus was acting as an electrophile. And then if we do that, we form a carbocation intermediate. Okay. That's compared to the other species in solution, relatively unstable. It's an intermediate, so you can isolate it from the solution, right? but it wants to react further. So the next step is quicker. Right? It's a rapid reaction with a nucleophile. And Right, that was what we had for an alkene plus HBr, but we can always follow this general reaction scheme. An alkene reacts with an electrophile, and then if it forms a carbocation intermediate, it reacts with a nucleophile. And then we're, we're going to get a bunch of reactions from chapter six, but they're all following that general scheme. Just identify the electrophiles and the nucleophiles and pair them together. Overall, right, we're looking at the addition of the electrophile to one of the sp2 carbons and the nucleophile to the other. And then they go from sp2 hybridized in the alkene to sp3 hybridized in the final product, right? So this is the electrophile in the first step, the nucleophile in the second step. We net added them to the alkene, right? Which is now an alkene. They went from sp2 hybridized to sp3 hybridized. Right? You notice the labels for slow and fast. This being slow is the rate determining step, that term that we got from chapter five. It's a rate determining step that limits the reaction overall. So what features do these reactions have in common? I've alluded to them all already, right? Loosely held pi electrons. Those give us our electron density. That is what allows it to act as a nucleophile. Therefore, it's attracted to an electrophile, that is our first step. All of these reactions in chapter six start like that. Okay. The alkene acting as a nucleophile and reacting with a variety of electrophiles. 
all of the reactions also finish with the addition of a nucleophile. Some of them just have more steps than others, but they finish by the addition of a nucleophile. The net result is the addition to the alkene, which has now become an alkane, right? It went from sp2 to sp3 hybridized. Each of the carbons, the vinylic carbons that were involved in the alkene, got a new sigma bond. And again, general reaction scheme. We saw it with HBr before. Here we see it with Y and Z. The key is identify the electrophile, identify the nucleophile later on, know where the bonds go. So with that information, we can expand on our initial reaction a little bit further. This is the reaction we got from chapter five, an alkene plus HBr. It produces an alkyl bromide in this case. But we can make it a little more generic than that. Okay? We can call this first reaction of alkenes, the first one we're getting from chapter six, the addition of hydrogen halides. This works with HBr, works with HI, works with HCl. Okay? So those are the three hydrogen halides it'll work with, HBr, HCl, HI. It does not work with HF. Okay? So you cannot use HF for this reaction. And with the general idea that, right, you add the H, you add the halogen, right, halide, and your net product is an alkyl halide. We added HBr. We added H, which is implied but not shown here, and I. Right. Now, in this case, these things are symmetrical about the alkene. Okay, plain of symmetry right here, plain of symmetry right there. Uh, and the carbons, the vinylic carbons, have the same substituent. So where I add the hydrogen and add the halogen doesn't matter. Right? I just pick it. One gets the hydrogen, one gets the halide. But the question moving forward for the rest of the chapter is what if they aren't the same? I take this alkene, for example. It's no longer symmetrical about the alkene. Here I've got two hydrogens. Here I have two methyl groups. So depending on where I put the H, and I put the Cl, I get two different products, either a tert butyl chloride or isobutyl chloride. T butyl chloride coming from adding the Cl here and the H over here, isobutyl chloride from adding the Cl over here and the H down there. Right, so we can get some information about what's known as the selectivity of the reaction okay, by actually doing it and seeing what happens using the reaction yields to get some information. Okay. So let's think about what's going on. Okay. The first step is taking the pi bond, right? those electrons are acting as a nucleophile, and reacting them with that hydrogen. Okay. Hydrogen, right, because it's got that delta positive, is acting as an electrophile, which breaks the HCl bond. Now, depending on which hydrogen I give, or sorry, which carbon I give that hydrogen to, I will form a different carbocation. Okay. Here, if I add the hydrogen to carbon one, then I get a t-butyl cation. Down here, if I add the hydrogen to carbon two here, then I put the positive charge on the end, get the isobutyl cation. And as you can see on the slide with the X right here, and the descriptions on the right-hand side, as it turns out, when you do the reaction, even though in theory, when you draw it out, you could form two products, T-butyl chloride is the only product that's made. And it has to do with the difference in stability between those two carbocations. And to elaborate on that, we need to consider the mechanism step-by-step step what's happening, as we see here, and the fact that the formation of the carbocation, the carbocation itself is the intermediate. But that first step is endergonic, and the formation of the carbocation is the rate determining step. It has the highest activation energy. So whichever one of these guys is formed faster, has a lower energy curve, right? Thinking in the world of kinetics, that's gonna be the dominant product. And if we consider carbocations, we're gonna to have to relate this to the transition state here in just a second. But thinking about, carbocations strictly, right, they have different stabilities. 
a tertiary carbocation, where I have three alkyl groups shown here as R, is the most stable type of carbocation. I can't have four, right? Because it's impossible to have a carbocation, a positively charged carbon with four groups to it because then it has a full octet. But three groups is the most stable, followed by two groups, followed by one, followed by none, which is the methyl cation. Right. So to put this differently, the stability of a carbocation increases as the number of the alkyl substituents increases. Kind of like the stability we saw in chapter five of alkenes. Looking at those vanillic carbons of an alkene, the more alkyl substituents, the more stable it is. Same thing for carbocations. The more alkyl groups, the more stable it is. Because the presence of those alkyl groups decreases the concentration of the positive charge on the carbon. Right? You can see a high positive charge here on the methyl cation, less so in these electrostatic potential maps on the t-butyl cation here. And in terms of energetics, things don't like to have a high charge. You can think about it like a game of, I don't know, hot potato, right? It's trying to share that charge with as many other carbons as it can. And it does that by hyperconjugation, which is a term that was introduced, I think in chapter two or three, right? and then we shelved it for a little bit and now it's back again. When we have a carbocation, right, a positive charge on those carbons, that means we have an empty p orbital. So those neighboring alkyl groups right, can kind of move electrons from their sigma orbitals to that empty p orbital, the vacant p orbital. Right? And just giving a little bit of the electron density there is helping out with the positive charge there. So it's not like they're fully donating electrons, but it's just kind of sharing the burden. Yep. And sharing the burden of that positive charge between multiple carbons, right, as we see here with three alkyl groups, makes the burden easier. Yep. The more atoms involved, the more stable that positive charge is, it's more dispersed. So hopefully that makes sense. So how does this tie in to our reaction mechanism? If we have to consider the transition state itself, okay? because I said whichever thing is formed faster has a lower energy barrier, right? A smaller curve looking at the reaction coordinate diagram is gonna predominate. But changing the stability of the intermediate doesn't have any effect there. Right, that's an thermodynamic argument. We're thinking about kinetics. I'm trying to lower the energy of the transition state so the intermediate gets formed faster, um, which is kind of what is already set up here. Rate of reaction, lower free energy of activation is faster. But I need to know what the transition state looks like. Right? We can't isolate a transition state at all by definition. Uh, but we get some information from what's known as the Hammond postulate. The Hammond postulate tells us that the transition state is most similar in structure to whatever structure it's most similar to in energy. So putting it as a picture of a graph right here, the closer things are in energy, looking at a reaction coordinate diagram, the more closely they resemble one another in structure. So looking at the reaction coordinate diagram, for an exergonic reaction versus an endergonic reaction will give you some information about the transition state. The transition state's always at the top of those curves, right? We learned that in chapter five. But then find what it's closer to in energy, right? Just looking at the peaks and the valleys, what's it closer to? For anything that's exergonic, right? Meaning it goes down and gives free energy there. The transition state is closer to the reactants. So that tells me that the structure of the transition state, because it's closer in energy to the reactants, the structure of the transition state is gonna look more like the reactants than it does the products. For an endergonic reaction here, the transition state is closer in energy to the products. So the structure of the transition state is going to look like the products. That's what the Hammond postulate tells us in a lot more words. If whatever the transition state is closer to in energy, 
it's closer to in structure. So if I'm thinking about the transition state for my addition of hydrogen halides, right, that first step going from the alkene to the carbocation intermediate is endergonic. That means that the transition state for the first step, which we already said is the rate determining step, resembles the intermediate itself. The transition state for the first step, the rate determining step, represents the carbocation, or sorry, is closer in structure to the carbocation intermediate. So everything we just talked about in regard to the stability of the carbocation, we could also use to argue for the transition state. So anything that's stabilized and intermediate is going to stabilize the transition state. Stabilizing the transition state means it's at a lower in energy state level. So we have a smaller activation energy and we form it faster. So tying back here, okay, looking at the two possibilities, okay, I add my hydrogen here or I add my hydrogen here. Well, one way I'm going to get a secondary carbocation. Okay. The other way I'm going to get a primary carbocation. Okay. That's looking at the intermediates, but we said that the transition state represents the intermediate itself. Okay. So I don't wanna form a primary carbocation because it's unstable. Right? I want as many alkyl groups on that cation, two in this case, as possible. So that's the more stable intermediate, which was achieved through the more stable transition state. So it's more stable itself and it gets formed faster. Okay. So in that reaction, I only make two chloropropane because there's a big difference in those rates in which they're formed. So I only ever get one product. Okay. Notice the X here. We'll look at reactions later on where there's just a small difference in rate and it's possible to get multiple products. But here, right, there's a big difference in the rate, big difference in the energetics due to the formation of that carbocation intermediate going through the rate determining step. And that's why we see these reactions be selective. It's what's known as regio selectivity, okay, which is the first vocab word we're gonna have from the second video in chapter six, regio selectivity. Okay. So jumping back to that reaction here, do I add the H here or do I add the H here? Well, I don't make that product on the right. Okay. Thinking about what's gonna go on in this video or in this reaction, right? My pi electrons are going to attack that hydrogen. And that's the first step. But now what we learned from this video, where do I put the positive charge? Right. Got my CH3. CH3, I know I broke that pi bond, but do I put the positive charge here or do I put the positive charge here? Well, thinking about the stability of those carbocations, right? This one would only have one alkyl group attached to it, but putting the positive charge here, now that has three alkyl groups. That's a huge difference and stability. Okay. And then the Cl minus that was produced here, right, the chloride then comes back around, attacks that positive charge. And that is how we get the only product formed in this reaction. Right. Getting this product on the right-hand side would have required having a carbocation right here, primary carbocation. Those are unstable, those aren't formed, so we don't get that product. That's the framework for this and other reactions in chapter six at regioselectivity. So that's what we will continue with for video two in chapter six.